Okay, I see people are joining. Uh, welcome, everyone. Okay, I will already start with a short introduction so that we can surely start in time. Um, welcome to our last lunch talk of the season. Um, my name is Annelies van Dijk, and I am the project manager of the Psychom Academy at Saimingo. And for the people who do not know us, uh, Saimingo is a Flemish nonprofit organization here based in Brussels. And we are actually actively involved in the various aspects of science communication. And specifically with the Psychom Academy, uh, we want to help researchers to reach out and to communicate their research to a broader audience. And for this, uh, we offer on one hand, dedicated in-person trainings here in Brussels, um, like for example, uh, popular science writing or trainings on how to optimize your social media use as a scientist, but also how to pitch your research in a three minute video, uh, all different aspects. And I'm very happy to announce that we just launched our new spring season of trainings and you can check it out by uh, scanning the QR code here and it will take you directly to our sites. On the other hand, we also organize monthly free lunch talks that cover a wide range of topics related to science communication. And they have, yeah, we host them both in English and in Dutch. And previously we had lectures on how to write a book as a scientist or more interactive panels discussions on, uh, for example, citizen sciences. You can rewatch many of these on our YouTube channel. Um, and we will also kick off our new 2024 season on January 19 with a lecture by Pedro, Pedro de Bruquera, um, who will tell us more about how to identify good science and why we still often fall for false scientific claims. So if you're interested in that, also check out the QR code to register there. And uh, if you want to know more about our upcoming program or about all of the lectures we will still organize in 2024, you can also subscribe to our newsletter by scanning this QR code um, and it will give you direct access to it. Okay, I will then dive into the topic of today, scientific documentaries. And for that, I'm joined today by two experts in the field. Uh, we have Frank Moons with us and Peter Tom Jones. Frank is the co-founder and festival director of DocPhil, which is the documentary film festival in Leuven. And today, Frank will mainly, I think, I think uh, tell us more about the Sciencefil project, which is a relative new scientific section within the festival. And this also features a competition to produce your own scientific documentary. So he will tell us more about how uh, you can compete and what it exactly is. And on the other hand, we have Tom with us. Tom is the director of the Institute for Sustainable Metals and Minerals at the KU Leuven. But besides that, he is also the presenter of several documentaries on sustainability, and he has also authored several books about this topic. And his last documentary only premiered last month, but it was already selected or it already received an award uh, just last week. So I think it will be very interesting to hear more about his journey and also about all of his different uh, documentaries he has made. So with that, I think I have introduced myself and speakers enough. So I will soon give the floor to Frank first, but I would like to encourage you to ask your questions in the Q&A window below, and I will try to tackle as many as the, uh, many uh, of them as possible at the end of the talk or in between if they are really relevant at the time of speaking. Okay, thank you. Well, let me start by sharing my screen. You should be able to see something right now. Voila. Hi, thank you for uh, for having me. I'm Frank uh, Muntz. Said I am festival director of Dogville. Let me very very quickly say something about uh, about Dogville. We are the largest documentary film festival in Belgium. Just a little brag. We are also the only Academy Award uh, qualifying. Uh, you've heard about the Oscars. I guess uh, if you're a documentary filmmaker, really the only way to get nominated for an Oscar is to win at one of the Oscar qualifying festivals. And we are very happy to, to be one of the 28 uh, festivals in the world that can be um, 
well, that can be qualifying for this uh, for this first step. It's not the not the last step, but the first step in the process. Also, our 20th edition uh, is going to be in 2024, obviously, but from March 20 to 28. So I would suggest to put it in your calendar already. Um, but I'm not going to talk that much about Dogville in general, but more about a new section that was added this year dedicated to science. And we called it Scienceville. And we thought it was a very funny joke on Dogville, Scienceville. You'll be the judge. Um, so let's go over to Scienceville. Scienceville uh, does a lot of things, too much to really um, sum up in a half an hour, uh, but let's just summarize that we do lots of stuff for kids from science uh, shows and workshops and experiments uh, aimed at children, but also for adults, obviously, like having extended Q&As with uh, science experts or other experts also doing panel debates about, for instance, uh, nuclear energy and whether it's, it's or isn't the savior for the climate crisis. But so many other things, we do nature walks and we gaze at the stars. We do so many uh, things, have done so many things over the years. Um, uh, that are science related, but obviously, as we are a film festival, we are mostly focused on uh, films, obviously. And now let's forget about all the rest and focus on those films. Because I said I've, I've been doing uh, science film only this year, but I've been doing documentary festival for 19 years, and we've always had a little uh, uh, not a little, we also had, all, always had a love for uh, science-related films, even if we didn't have a separate section for it. Um, but I've noticed over the years, there's not that many great author-driven uh, science documentaries, feature-length, that are meant to be seen on a giant screen in the, in, the, in the cinema. There are lots of documentaries, lots of them, most of them are author-driven, most of them are made for cinema but not so much for science subjects. And even in this small section of science-related uh, other documentaries, most of them tend to be either American or uh, Canadian. So if I remove the European ones, you see the majority of them are all American, with exception of a few, no, two Canadian ones in between. Why is that? Why aren't there more auto-driven science documentaries? And to answer this question, I think I first have to start with this, yeah, this word I keep using, author documentary, auteur documentaire, auto-driven documentary, a lot of different terms, but to explain it, and I am, Festival director, I see a lot of films. I'm going to uh, let you see <clears throat> my favorite short documentary of all time. It's only five minutes. Um, so I'm sure, at least I hope, you will enjoy yourself. But before we uh, watch the film, oh yeah, I have to mention, it's not a science documentary about the sea. And that was a conscious decision because I want to make it more um general if i if i show you one specific science documentary or even fragment of a science documentary i i was afraid you were going to focus too much on a specific science or a specific um scientist being uh, being portrayed portrayed there no this is an artist documentary a documentary about a certain artist and just you know imagine yourself that you are a filmmaker and i ask you as a filmmaker to create a five minute documentary that is both informative because it has to explain the life and work of one of the most influential artists of the 20th century. And it has to have your own voice and it has to be entertaining for uh, a group of people that may never heard about this artist and maybe are not even that interested in art in general. How would you tackle that problem. Just try to create a mental image and then 
let's wa let's watch this uh, documentary in which at least I hope you will enjoy it as much as I did. This is John Baldessari's pencil. This is John Baldessari's chair. This is what John Baldessari sees when he sits at his desk. This is a film about John Baldessari, the artist. John Baldessari decided that this film should be narrated by me, Tom Waits. He's a, he got a great voice. Thanks, John. John Baldessari has been called the godfather of conceptual art, a master of appropriation, a surrealist for the digital age. He's made paintings, photographs, billboards, videos, films, sculptures, digital art, credit cards, and an iPhone app. In 1970, John Baldessari burned everything he ever made. It was in a crematorium, so the proper term would be cremated, I suppose. We'll get back to that. John Baldessari is a towering figure. He's six foot seven inches tall. Cool, yeah, you get a lot of, you know, how's the weather up there, blah, blah, blah. John Baldessari's studio door has two peepholes, regular height and Baldessari height. John Baldessari wonders about Clint Eastwood's height. How tall is he? John can be instantly recognized by his big, beautiful beard. So it's pretty much the same color as my hair. John Baldessari has had over 200 solo shows and over 1,000 group shows. John's awards and honors include membership in the American Academy of Arts and Letters, the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and the Golden Lion for Lifetime Achievement Award at the Venice Biennale in 2009. For the Art of Lifetime Achievement Jesus Christ. This is John Baldessari's coffee machine. That's John Baldessari's Wi-Fi password. In 100 years, John Baldessari suspects he will be best remembered as... Oh, the guy that put dots over people's faces. <laughs> John Baldessari is so successful that he carries absolutely nothing in his pockets. Not a thing. John Baldessari was born and raised in National City, California, 15 minutes from the Mexican border. Another former resident is me, Tom Waits. The art scene in National City in the 1960s was... It was probably me. <laughs> John printed text on canvas and he called it art. He also took photographs with intentionally bad compositions and he called it wrong. And the artist calls it artist's art. In 1970, John Baldessari decided to cremate all the paintings he made between 1953 and 1966. I still have the ashes in a bronze urn in the shape of a book suitable for your library shelf. This is John Baldessari's library. These are John Baldessari's push pins. Baldessari once said that the most important artist of the 1960s was not Andy Warhol or Jasper Johns, but the director. Jean-Luc Godard. I probably did say it. John Baldessari has a huge collection of film stills organized by subject. Guy riding a horse, Indian riding a horse, guy being shot with an arrow, Indian falling off a horse, and I, I, a lot of shots were kissing. This is John Baldessari's dog, Giotto. In 1971, John Baldessari made a famous announcement. I will not make any boring art. Baldessari made a video in which he wrote the phrase until the tape ran out. I will not make any more boring art. Baldessari had many photographs taken of himself, covering his face with different hats, waving at sailboats, hitting objects with a golf club. He was making art. I am making art. I am making art. I am making art. One day, John Baldessari made a simple discovery. Dots. I, I just had these price stickers I was using for something else in some graphic way, and I put them on all the faces, and I just felt like it leveled a playing field. Baldessari's work was hailed as cool, funny, cerebral, sardonic, provocative. I think it's just my take on the world. Baldessari's name is internationally recognized. Cool. Ladies think his name sounds sexy. I can live with that. John Baldessari's recent blockbuster exhibition, Pure Beauty, started at the Tate Modern in London, traveled to Barcelona, then to LACMA, then finally touched down at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. John Baldessari has influenced an entire generation of the world's leading artists. 
The studio is filled with thank you notes and inscribed books. Some of the inscriptions say gratitude, friendship, thank you, and mentor. John Baldessari believes that every young artist should know three things. One. Talent is cheap. Two. You have to be possessed, which you can't will. And three. Being at the right place at the right time. <laughs> make any more boring art. I will not make any more boring art. I will not make any more boring art. This is John Baldessari waving goodbye. Bye, John. This is John. So, I hope you enjoyed that. Uh... A short documentary as much as I did and we can discuss about different things and if it was uh, up to your liking or not but at least I think you have to agree that it's an auto-driven documentary so what does it mean in my eyes and it's 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 almost a touchy subject to uh, to to try to define because there literally are books and books written about auteur cinema mostly in French um and, you know, historically, it means that the director uh, is seen as an artist, as opposed to, you know, in the Hollywood system of uh, that started in the, you know, in the in the 30s, where the director was just a paid employee that hadn't didn't have his own voice, just had no no creativity he was wanted, he just had to do what the studios told him so. And there from there on, for instance, Godard was one of the one of the theoretical um, filmmakers that that really formed the theory. But remember, at least what I use as a catchphrase or a, or a thing to remember by is this one: What makes us all driven? Well, just ask yourself this question: If this documentary would have been, would have been made by another filmmaker, would it would it look the same, kind of the same, or not? And if it wouldn't, that means that you put your own creativity as a filmmaker into uh, your work. So I don't know how this mental uh, mental challenge I posed to you in the beginning of this uh, of this video of you know trying to imagine uh, what it would look like if you had to create a five minute documentary about an artist. I'm not sure how creative you have, would have been, and you might have you know come up with even a better plan. But I'm sure it wouldn't have it wouldn't have looked like this, and I think that is the core of auto-driven cinema. And auto-driven cinema is very often uh, seen as opposed to, well, what you would consider like typical TV work. Nothing wrong with TV work in itself, and I know there's also great television being made. So maybe not. Let's not call it TV work. Let's call it, you know the typical news reportage of 10, 15 minutes about a certain subject, you never know uh, who is responsible for the direct, you know, the director of a certain news fragment, do you? And you don't know it because, you no, know, it doesn't really matter. The, 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 the things you see on screen are not meant to be creative, are meant to be an efficient way of communicating the content of this of this film. And again, there's nothing wrong with that in itself, but that's not the kind of film we are looking for. It's also not the kind of film that people, at least according to me, the kind of film that people want to see in a cinema, let alone pay for a ticket to want to see it in the cinema. So why is it that this auto-driven documentary is you know, omnipresent in my world, at least. You know, I've I just finished uh, the submissions um, for the documentary. Submissions, that means that everyone, every filmmaker that created the film can submit to the festival and we'll, uh, we'll see it uh, if eventually. We have over, we have over 2,000 submissions every year. So there's a lot, a lot of documentaries being made. Very, a very small amount of them are scientific driven. Why is that? Well, I think there are a few reasons for that. Uh, one of them being, I think we have to be honest. There is a world of filmmakers and there's a world of scientists and researchers. 
And these two worlds, they don't really overlap that much. Secondly, um, I think, especially in the documentary film world, many uh, filmmakers go uh, or make documentaries because they want to they want to have some social issue they want to bring into attention, whether it be social injustice or maybe climate change uh, or some political goal. Not so much, I think, with science subject. And thirdly, and I'm not sure whether that's general for Europe, but that's le it's at least an important thing, I think, within Flanders. There is, at least for my generation, there is like a common trauma uh, in regards to school television. I'm not sure if any of any one of you, and please do let me know if you share that uh, that experience. But when I was in school, you know, we had these moments in which this uh, giant television, you know, this very old television, was rolled into the classroom on this, you know, wobbly construction with wheels, and then you would see a documentary or at least something similar to a documentary about a certain subject uh, that was explained there. And to be honest, I don't remember that much about it anymore, uh, but I'm quite sure it's the documentaries being made there weren't supposed to be very creative. It was only meant for the content that was in there. And with the creation, I'm, I'm, I'm skipping a bit here, but with the creation of the Flemish Archville Fund, the FAF, the one, the organization that funds uh, films, it really was meant as a way to do everything different from what they used to do. So we used to do school television, but now there's a new fund. So now we're going to do completely, going to be completely in a different way. And to be honest, it was a great decision. The Flemish cinema since the creation of FAF has never been uh, so good. So it was a good decision, but it led to some, um, it led at least for documentaries, that documentaries were uh, more and more auto-driven, which is good, but less and less content, uh, content driven. I think there has to be a way in which can be content driven on a science subject, but also auto driven. I think it's possible to do both, but it didn't happen. And it doesn't happen. And that's maybe the fourth reason why there's a little science related documentaries. If nobody does it, you have to be the first one to do it. You have to be the first one to convince commissions that it's possible to do so. And it's kind of stuck in this endless loop of, oh, well, it doesn't happen, so I will not do it. But, but as I don't do it, it doesn't happen. So we as a festival thought, well, let's change this, try to change this ourselves. And we created uh, ambitious, I might say, in all uh, modesty program of, you know, let's create our own science author documentaries. And we did this this year, and we will do this next year too. And there's a bit difference, I will explain later. Um, we did it as a few phases. First of all, we tried, well, first of all, actually, was try finding the right funds. I'm sure uh, that Peter will also uh, tell you this. It's not easy to find funds, and you must uh, take into account uh, a normal short documentary subsidized via the FAF has a budget between 40 and 60,000 euro. Um, as the FAF didn't participate in this project, it was something of the festival. We had to find our own funds. I spare you the problems we had. Um, but the university, universities in the beginning that wanted to participate uh, needed to bring a little part, a little financial input as well. It uh, turned out to be too difficult for most universities this year. So only the university in Brussels, the VUB, participated. Well, anyway, the first phase was just that. The university asked their own scientists, their own uh, professors, do you have a certain subject, a certain research going on that you think that might be in, of interest of making a documentary about? So uh, people could send in their ideas be via mail or via an online web form. Um, followed by that, uh, we made a pre-selection, uh, we, I mean, the university and the festival too, of the 10 most interesting or most promising uh, promising projects. And, you know, I said interesting, but it's really interesting in function of a documentary because you can have great 
uh, a great subject, great research, but you have to make a documentary of it in the end. And it has to be it has to be possible to make the documentary in the course of one year. Well, anyway, so the 10 most promising projects. Then we trained, we media trained the selected uh, project and selected researchers, to be honest, uh, to, to be uh, more clear, um, to be able to present themselves in a pitch, in a public pitch. This pitch was held at a festival in which, so a pitch in which the researcher got between two and three minutes, two and three minutes to explain uh, their research to a general audience and then followed up uh, by a little Q&A. A general audience, but in that audience were also 10 filmmakers, 10 filmmakers selected by the festival. After the pitch, um, the filmmakers and the, maybe I should let you see this, these were, we had 10, uh, we had 10 um, researchers, you know, five of them, very nervous, but very good uh, pitches of film, of, of sorry, of scientists. It was uh, um, talked together by uh, Hetty Helsmorgel. And then the final phase came of uh, people like, going on speed date with each other. So the scientists met individual filmmakers and vice versa. And in these speed date, uh, you know, the directors could just probe a bit about their general ideas of how to tackle the subject, what could be the main the main character of a of a documentary what's able what 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 can you actually film from the research you're proposing um after this i'm going to go back to this slide after this first speed date the directors are now the ones that have to work they got two weeks to prepare a first idea about how to make a movie and how about you know what what the main subject is what the, what the storyline is um and then it was for the directors to pitch their ideas and from those ideas pitched by the directors, two winners were announced, two winners that got um, 40,000 euro uh, grant by the festival. And as you know, there is something like um, a, a, a system from a tech shelter system in which you can basically make this 40,000 euro into 60,000 60, euro you can actually spend on your films. Those two films have to be finished for uh, the world premiere on DocPhil, on Science Film, next year. So I'm sure you already written the dates in your calendar for next year, but also write down March 21st, 2024, which will be the opening of Science Film and the presentation of those newly created documentaries. Maybe I just, just shoot at. Oh no, I almost forgot. What are the two documentaries that actually came out of this, uh, out of this program? Two totally different, uh, uh, totally different subjects. One of them, Coral City, it's about the, the, mig the migration of coral seeds in the Indian Pacific uh, oceans. It's a uh, work by uh, Dr. Professor Dr. Mark Kochius and made by two female uh, directors that also had a few uh, films at the festival in the previous year. And the other one is uh, Testerep, uh, made by uh, Vincent Langhoush and Testerep, is about the, um, the vanished island that used to be in, uh, in front of uh, Os Ostende, Ostend, but it's now uh, overrun by, um, by water. Two completely different... Yeah. Subject to also two complete, completely different uh, filming styles. At least I think so. I haven't uh, I haven't seen them yet. I'm very curious to look at the results. If you happen to be at one of the participating universities, you're very welcome to still participate for next edition. Uh, it's not only the VAP anymore. Now you can be one of the three universities that participates in this program next to the FAO, uh, which we're very grateful of. Uh, but uh, for the universities, if you belong to U University of Ghent, Antwerpen or Brussels, you're very welcome to submit your project. I think there is a link uh, in my presentation as well. Just uh, go to that doc.be slash science pitch. Um, there is still time till the beginning. No, sorry, the middle of January for Antwerpen and Brussels or the end of January for Ghent 
Ghent uh, decide to participate a bit later in the program. Therefore, they have a bit more time. And we expect to see maybe your film in March 2025. Voila. That's it for me. I'm happy to answer any questions you might have now or after the presentation of uh, of my uh, of the of uh, of, of uh, Peter Tom Jones. Uh, thank you for your attention. Yes, I see there's no questions yet. So I think we first continue with uh, the next presentation. But please do ask your questions in the chat or in the Q and A window if you have any. All good. Yes. Okay. Made in Europe from mine to electric vehicle is what I will be talking about in the next 30 minutes. Make no mistake, the tsunami of cheap subsidized Chinese electric vehicles is coming and Europe is sleepwalking into an abyss. That's the opening statement in our new documentary, and I will first show you the trailer. And I hope you can also hear it. Make no mistake about it. The tsunami of Chinese electric vehicles is coming. And Europe is sleepwalking into an abyss. Decarbonization is leading to deindustrialization in Europe, and the competition isn't always fair. Sometimes it, it feels that we are not competing on the same rules with our competitors. If it's not fair, we have to just simply use our uh, trade uh, defense mechanisms. As long as the European automotive industry will start to feeling much better than today. We need to get our act together, from mine to electric vehicle. In 10 years, how many new mines do you think we will have in Europe? I hope that we talk about at least something between 10 to 15. But not everyone is in favor. The indigenous Sami people say their reindeer husbandry culture is endangered. We can live without metals, but we can't live without food. The climate clock is ticking, and our clean tech industry is under pressure. I have read in a Chinese newspaper, the global north is lost. Yeah, but somebody once said the Titanic was unsinkable. The full story in our new documentary, Made in Europe, from mine to electric vehicle. It's gonna be fun. Okay, back to the slideshow. So I hope that has whetted your appetite to watch the full documentary, which is available on this Vimeo link here. And I'm sure that you'll get this link later on. Um, so before I talk about uh, how we make uh, documentaries, I will briefly just give you some background on who we are and why we exist. Uh, so first of all, um, yes, I'm the director of SimSquare Kai Leuven, which is the Kai Leuven Institute for Sustainable Metals and Minerals. I've been in the research field for almost 30 years now as a research manager and involved in many European and other types of projects. For us, the basic um, idea is that without metals, there is no transition to a climate neutral society. So we will need large quantities of lithium, cobalt, nickel, rare earths to drive this transition, which is actually being discussed as we speak in Dubai in one of these uh, nonsensical conferences, which never lead to anything, basically. So the Institute of um, Guy Leuven Sim Square is now uh, existing for several years. Uh, we, we group around 226 people across the, the university. They come from many different uh, research groups, departments, and even faculties. 
So it's a very interdisciplinary setting. And we do a lot of research. Obviously, that's our bread and butter. That's why we exist. Uh, we work across the entire supply chain from exploration to mining, refining, recycling of metals uh, and doing all the policy assessment, sustainability assessment of uh, those uh, flow sheets. But I will not uh, bother you with those kind of details. Um, what is important to know for this particular presentation is that we are extremely active in big European multi-partner projects, uh, starting in FP7 a long time ago, Horizon 2020 and now Horizon Europe. Here you see a um, uh, suits of acronyms and logos of the various uh, projects that we are, are involved in. And all of these are related to critical metals. Now, one of the important things in these projects more and more is that uh, European Commission is asking for public outreach. So we need to communicate, not just to scientists, but also to the broader public. And that's exactly the reason why I am sitting here today talking to my screen and hopefully quite a lot of people who are listening to this. So that's what we will discuss here. So communication, dissemination, yeah, obviously we have a traditional uh, website that um, does a lot of the dissemination work, but it needs to be more than that. So we're also very active uh, in terms of uh, LinkedIn strategies. I will show more about that later. So we have a a good LinkedIn page. We also have uh, personal LinkedIn pages, which are crucial to, to disseminate our messages. Also, when we bring out documentaries, LinkedIn is really our vector to, to communicate to the outside world and to reach a lot of people with relatively little um, efforts. So, Specifically now about SimSquare and videos, because we have a long history in making uh, videos about our research, our research projects. And in the beginning, when we started, we mainly worked on short project videos, which lasted uh, just one or two minutes, sometimes maybe three or four minutes, but not more than that. They were always short, uh, very short uh, project videos. And if you go to our SimSquare YouTube page, you will you can find the catalog of uh, these different types of, of films. You can see there's loads of them that we've made over the last years. And what we see uh, is that these kind of videos are having lower impact all the time. So when we started the, with our first one, which is like seven or eight years ago, which was about landfill mining, um, we were one of the first to make these kind of project videos, these animated project videos. We worked with, with story runner Stan Van Baarle. We still work with him today. And when we published those uh, videos, we had a lot of attention. So, for example, this one here was, was made with Ray Cox uh, on landfill mining in one of our projects. And we had uh, more than 50,000 views in a couple of days. So not bad for such a video. The cost of such a video was around 20,000 euros. If we use an expensive presenter like Ray Cox, or if we presented ourselves, then the cost would be around 10,000 euros. But then we started making loads of these. And the thing was that all the other European projects started copying this. So we could see there was a, an abundance, an avalanche, a tsunami of new short project video. So basically every single European project came out with its own video. And we saw there was an explosion of videos on LinkedIn, on YouTube, on Vimeo, on every social channel. So when we look at our some of our latest um, publications in terms of these short videos, we see that instead of getting 50,000 views, we were getting like 500 views. So that's a big difference. And the costs obviously remained the same. So the return on investment of what we were doing was decreasing very rapidly. So we said, okay, we have to do something different. And that's where we decided two years ago, together with Stan van Baarle, to start focusing on longer documentaries rather than these short films. And last year, 
around November 2022, we came out with our first our first um, longer documentary, which was a 22-minute documentary on responsible mining in Europe. And when we launched the trailer and the video a couple of days later, we reached more than 100,000 people in a very short time. So again, we went back to the, the real impact figures that we actually need. And also in terms of the press impact, it was enormous. So my life got very complicated once this film was published because I was being uh, attacked by certain people. Uh, and also I was getting a lot of requests for interviews from a lot of different newspapers. I will just show you this trailer as well. Uh, it's the trailer that was published uh, more than a year ago, but it's also worth watching this particular one. Bear with me. Europeans want Teslas, but they don't want the mines that produce the metals in their backyard, and that's extremely hypocritical. The common perception is we don't have any resources in Europe. But it's wrong. We want to know that the metals that go into the wind turbine, that it is produced in a good way. So we want ethical mining, basically. For me, responsible and ethical are quite close. I would very much support the European self-sufficiency of metals. If you don't have metals, there's no green transition. So that was the trailer of the documentary we produced last year, Responsible Mining in Europe. And the impact, uh, in fact, it, it was huge. Um, I dare to say even that it somehow had an impact on the, the political discussion that was happening within the European Commission about the role of mining in Europe. And recently, the European Commission came out with its new European Critical Raw Materials Act, and uh, this is a very important document because it will determine the strategy of the European Union in terms of how we deal with our critical raw materials dependencies on the likes of China and Russia. And for the first time ever, there was an official document in which mining in Europe was actually officially promoted. And we are convinced that our documentary had at least some role to play in that discussion, because it really moved the needle in that discussion. And if you now try to find that documentary on Google, you will see there is an enormous amount of articles and interviews that were created as a result of that documentary. So it really had impact. Uh, just to give you a couple of um, aspects here in terms of what we did. So it was a collaboration between Stan van Baar, the story runner, um, who was the director of the film, and myself uh, as a scientist presenting the film. Uh, the film was 22 minutes long. It was filmed in Sweden and Belgium. And it was funded through basically one big European project. And the cost of making that documentary was higher than 80,000 euros. So this is a typo here. It's not 80 euros. It was 80,000 euros. And that excludes my in-kind contribution, spending uh, three full months working on that. So if you include that cost as well, the, the price goes up pretty heavily. What we learned from, from that, of course, is that a good documentary has to be controversial. If it's just boring and uh, it doesn't take any clear, it doesn't make any clear statements, then people will not discuss it. So that's why the first sentence of this film was about the Europeans being hypocritical. They all want Teslas, but they don't want the mines in their backyard. A lot of people get angry with me when I say that in a documentary and all the communication about it. But that's what is triggering the whole discussion by making strong statements. It's typically not what scientists dare to do, but then again, I'm certainly not a typical scientist uh, anyway. What we also learned is that yeah, in that film, we were supposed to show the opinions of the anti-mining lobby in, in Europe. 
and they were actually invited to participate in the film. And two minutes before we actually had to film them, they suddenly decided that they didn't want to be filmed anymore. And as a result, that uh, opinion of being against mining in Europe was not covered in the documentary. Now, if you're working for a national TV station, then no problem. You would just say, OK, let's find someone else later and we'll, we'll film that part again. But because we were working against a deadline and we had very limited budget, we just couldn't uh, include that opinion in, in the documentary. And of course, if you don't have this other opinion in a documentary, you will automatically be seen as being biased and not uh, giving any attention to alternative different voices. So what we also realize is that we need higher budgets basically to make such documentaries. So, so we didn't have 80,000 whatsoever, we had less. So we had to find the, the rest of the money left, right and center in residual budgets. Not so easy. So this brings me to the most recent documentary, which um, is called Made in Europe from Mine to Electric Vehicle. I already showed you the trailer at the beginning of this talk. Um, so let me just speak a bit more about how do we do this? Uh, what's the strategy? Uh, because it's not a walk in the park, it's, that's clear. So it's a big job. Um, it takes a long time. So Stan and myself, we had lots of discussions and stuck in OPEC and all these places to, to brainstorm first about the story, because you need a story, you need a narrative, you need something unique. It's not, not a boring thing. You really need to come up with something which sticks, something that people will be interested in. Uh, secondly, obviously, you need a lot of research uh, going into it. So you want to come up with the right facts and figures, the right numbers, the right infographics. So there's a lot of research to be done behind the scenes. Furthermore, because our films are being funded partially through European projects, we also need to engage with the consortia that are funding the project. So we need to show the script, the storyboard to a lot of people who might have different opinions about it. So we also need to interact with all these people to see, okay, are you happy with what we're going to do? And then move on from that. Fourthly, we, you really need to, to talk to the people that you are going to interview, because in this case, in, in this new film, we were interviewing the CEOs of big companies. We were interviewing the, the second most powerful man in the European politics, uh, Maro Sefcovic, the executive vice president of the European Commission. Uh, we needed five meetings prior to the actual interview to agree that we were allowed to interview him and to discuss the scope of the interview. So you can't be wasting these people's time. So you really need to think very carefully about what are you going to do in such an interview. So a lot of preparation goes into that. We also interviewed it, interviewed one of the leaders of the Sami parliament, the indigenous population in the north of Sweden and Finland and Norway. Again, um, you really need to prepare. In this case, we need we needed anthropological support in order to ask the right questions and to engage with these people. Not straightforward whatsoever. So then we, we started filming in the, the first and second week of September 2023. We had one week in Sweden, close to Father Christmas uh, in the North Pole of, of Sweden, in places like Aitik and um, in um, Kiruna. Then we had one week in Finland where we traveled uh, throughout the south of Finland and had to visit lots of different places. And finally, also one day in the Berlamont building in Brussels to interview Sefcovic. Again, Stan was the director, I was the presenter. And just to be clear on that, we also need a very good film crew. So you need really top professionals in terms of cameramen, in terms of sound technicians. So without these people, there is no film. So people don't think about that when they see the final product. But believe me, without proper cameramen and sound technicians, your final product will be hopeless and not worth watching. So big thank you to these people who've been working with us uh, for this film. So we, from a content point of view and, and the, the methodology on, on what we show, we have different types of footage. So we have what we call stand-ups. That's where the presenter, myself, uh, looks into the camera and makes certain statements. 
Then we have uh, interviews where I interview a second person and we have three cameras looking at that interview. So we have a shot where we see both of us. We have a shot where we see me and where we have a shot where we see the person that is being interviewed. We also did a lot of vox pop, which means that you go around and you randomly interview people on the street to get some public opinions about what is happening in this case about mining in the north of Sweden. And finally, we also have what we call voiceovers. This is where a very professional voice speaks in a certain sentences that, that we, of course, have written ourselves in order to combine different parts of the film. So just some photographs. Uh, we had the privilege to, to film in probably the, for me, the most beautiful part of, uh, of Europe. So really, really north uh, in, in Europe. So Kiruna, which is around 200 kilometers uh, above the, North, the Arctic Circle. So very special environment there. So we filmed both on the ground in one of the deepest underground mines in Europe or the deepest underground mine in Europe. So 1400 meters below ground, basically. Um, we also filmed in the largest open pit mine in Europe, a copper mine in Aitik. And we also went to speak to the Sami people. You can see that here on the, on the right. Uh, which is a completely different environment, of course, than the actual mine. Some more images of the, the footage that some of, some of it appears in the film. Or this shows uh, how it was done with the, with the cameraman, the soundman, and so on. So then let's speak about the, the launch strategy, because making the, the documentary is one thing. But then, of course, once it's there, you need to do something with it. You need to launch it in a proper way. and that really needs a very good strategy. So we, we did this uh, in separate steps. So we first released the trailer, the short uh, film of 1.5 minutes. Then uh, we had a big press release. Uh, secondly, we had, or thirdly, we had two avant-premieres. And only then we released the, the full documentary so that it became visible for everyone. And then finally, we also started releasing some of the vodcasts, so some of the, the full interviews we did with some of the key people in the documentary itself. So um, also that goes together with a very clear social media strategy. So when we launched the trailer, uh, we made sure that we use all possible channels, uh, so personal LinkedIn channels, but also the Kai Leuven official corporate channels and some... Um, some channels by people who are very influential, in, in this case, in the field of electric vehicles, like Roger Atkins in Britain. So then we had two big avant-premiere events. The first one was in, uh, in Leuven, where we had more than 400 people watching the documentary for the first time, and then a brilliant reception afterwards with lots of uh, people smiling. Uh, and then three days later, we did the same thing, over again, but now in Brussels during the EU Raw Materials Week, which is the, the most important week um, where all the key people in the field of raw materials uh, come together in, in Europe, uh, in Brussels, in La Plaza Hotel. So all the people from the parliament, the commission, the companies, the NGOs, the academics, they're all there. So a really influential moment to spread the news about the documentary. And then finally, we actually launched the documentary on, on Vimeo, so it's publicly available now. And that was also done through a, a LinkedIn campaign. Um, you can see here the post, the mother post, which had around 40,000 impressions and 549 likes, 60 comments, and 142 reposts. So we, we reached quite a lot of people uh, with this strategy. Furthermore, we also then launched three additional vodcasts. So these were the complete interviews that we did with three essential persons in the film. So on the one hand, Mara Sefcovic, Executive Vice President, European Commission, Jan Moström, the CEO of LKAB, the big Swedish owned uh, mining company. And then finally, uh, Stefan Mikalsson, the leader of the Sami parliament. I will just very briefly show you a 
fragment of the interview with Sefcovic. Um, so you also get to see the way we, we set up the cameras and the kind of questions that we, we ask. of the European Parliament with the member states, uh, I believe that before the end of the year we will have a, I would say, general agreement on the Critical Raw Materials Act. And I would say immediately uh, we should start to work on, 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 on the list uh, of what should be this uh, strategic project if it comes to the, to the mining. So we can very quickly build consensus, which are these 10, 15, 20 mines we would like to support, and then look uh, for project promoters, financing, and, and work on all the details so we would see it as a concrete project. Because financing is one of the difficult parts. Uh, I've seen recently that uh, clearly the political mood in terms of mining in Europe has, has changed for the better. But the investment mood hasn't. We still see that investors prefer to put their money in gigafactories rather than in mines. So how do we how do we get the investors on board? I, I, I would say that the uh, that the same mood as it is now is uh, with mines was uh, was uh, five years with with gigafactories. When I was starting with the European Battery Alliance, there was also lots of hesitation in that regard. But uh, what the investors need to see are the first successful projects, and then the mood changes. But I agree with you that. Uh, when I talk. So I'll leave it there with that fragment. Um, so just to show that we launched uh, three additional of these vodcasts, which again had their own attention and reached uh, different people. So then also interesting to have a quick look at the press reaction. I'll just show you a couple of slides with several interviews uh, that were resulting from the, the launching of this documentary. documentary. So we we really got access to all the, the key newspapers, uh, Financial Times, uh, Financial Dagblad, the TED, uh, Euractive, uh, the Morgan, the Standard, Lecho. So we had a lot of um, attention in the press. Even ROB TV came to the to the avant premiere of our documentary. And also Kai Leuven created the Kai Leuven story on the uh, homepage of the website, which reaches a lot of people because it's such a big website, of course, Skyler. So then um, post-launch, we were also very happy to be nominated for the British Columbia Environmental Film Festival. Uh, that's still ongoing at the moment, so we don't know if we actually won a prize there, but we have won uh, our first prize with the best green and environment film in the very famous uh, Brussels Capital Film Festival. No, I'm joking there. I don't know how famous this one is. Frank can say more about that, but at least uh, we were accepted as the winner of the best green and environment film. And I find that very important that it's a green and environment film because this is also the message that we want to convey. So my final two slides um, to close off with this talk. Uh, which lessons have we learned? Uh, well, first of all, the budget that Frank was speaking about before is not enough whatsoever for making something like that, we, like like we did. So we're talking here about uh, a different uh, price category. The present documentary, without my own costs and without the cost of several people who had in-kind contributions uh, within Kai Leuven for this film, uh, we're talking about at least 130,000 euros to make this documentary, at least, uh, probably going to be even more. So you need to secure the, the relevant budget for doing that. And it's better to do that up front than to <laughs> a priori say, OK, it's more expensive than we thought it was. Secondly, you need a, a really professional team with a professional film director. Elstair van Baarle clearly is that, but not only the director, also the the technical people, the, the cameramen, the, the sound technicians, they are absolutely essential because you work under extreme pressure. If you are filming in the office of the executive vice president of the European Commission, they give you 40 minutes to come in and to get back out and everything needs to be done in that, in that period. So the pressure is enormous. If you are filming 1,400 meters below ground, um, the, the challenges are enormous. It's dark, uh, it's noisy. So without sound technicians, it's impossible to have that final product. So I really want to underscore the importance of, of those people in making a, a good quality documentary. Also, the, 
editing of the film, again, it's a huge, huge job, uh, which all looks easy if you just look at the final product. But if you're doing this yourself, then you realize how important and how difficult it is. All the key messages I want to give, yeah, you need a good story. So the film needs to follow a clear narrative. You need to know what you want to convey. It's not just about uh, a boring news report. So you really need to come up with a very special, unique selling proposition in terms of your narrative. Preparation is key. I think that came clearly uh, out of this uh, talk. And then post-production, you need a proper press strategy, a proper launch strategy. And if you do all of that, then the impact of such a documentary can be massive, of course. One, um, one thing that I do want to say is that it is very difficult to convince traditional TV stations to, to show such a film because they haven't been involved in making it. They have their own formats. They have their own um, time areas that they want to, to respect. So it's not straightforward to, to just go to VRT and say, hey, here is our documentary. Can you please show it? It doesn't work like that. So just a final word on our next documentary, which will be also about a very controversial topic. Uh, so it's specifically focusing on lithium mining and refining in Europe. Lithium is the poster boy for the clean tech transition. Without lithium, there is no transition to clean energy, to clean mobility. And in Europe, we have a lot of European uh, lithium deposits, but we have zero lithium mines at this moment in Europe because we have this NIMBY syndrome, not in my backyard syndrome. And just to show you the importance and the relevance of this topic, recently the Portuguese government fell. Uh, the prime minister, Antonio Costa, had to resign related to one of the potential lithium mines in Europe. So we will be probably filming in Portugal if I can also pay for some bodyguards to guarantee my safety when I go there. We will be going to Serbia, uh, Serbia, where we have the biggest lithium deposit in Europe, which is also a very controversial one, where the Serbian gov government blocked the Australian company Rio Tinto from starting the project, which was related to the uh, problem with Djokovic, the tennis player who went to try to play in the Australian Open, and he was kicked out by the Australian government because he wasn't vaccinated uh, during the COVID crisis. So it became very political, very, very tough, very dirty. So we'll be filming in at least in these two places just to show the, the complexity of can we open lithium mines that we really need to drive this transition to climate neutrality. But then we see that Europeans don't want mines in their backyard, but they do want the Teslas. And that is extremely hypocritical, which is basically the narrative of the story that we bring. And I will keep it there for you. So the, the full video can be seen here. And if you want to contact me, you can uh, look, at, look at these websites and my LinkedIn profile, Peter Tom Jones, where we have a lot of information about the interviews, documentaries, the vodcasts, and everything related. I thank you for your attention, even though I don't see you. Yeah, thank you both. Uh, I think we have time for maybe two questions for each speaker. I will just now already link uh, the two websites you both referred to in the chat, but they will also follow in the follow-up mails. So you can go check out there the Scienceville contest as well as the full documentary. Um, let's maybe ask first the question to Frank. So uh, Tom, you can catch some breath. Um, Frank, somebody asks a question in the chat um, because you say something about the three universities and also about the FWO, but is it also possible for non-FWO researchers to join the contest if they're related to the, to the three universities? Yeah, the only formal criteria is that you have to be related to one of the three universities. You know, FWO is supporting, but they don't have any further requirements. So yeah. And maybe, um, so you said that also the universities are involved in the selection procedure. Do you see that there's like a big difference in what the university selects for or what are their criteria compared to what then you or the directors opt for? Uh, well, we have only one year experience, so we still have to find out a bit. Uh, yeah, I think that there might be difference in ways 
that universities want to push their most prestigious, most important uh, work, but that does not mean that that's the most interesting uh, per se for filmmaker. It's also important to notice that the involvement of everyone really from the university ends at the selection of the the first selection of of uh, of, con of contestants in a way. So uh, each university can select three research or three projects that will go further. But from then on, the university is not involved anymore. So they don't have any say into the final selection of the of the project that will get funding in the end. That's solely a thing for the director, really, and the producer that will make the documentary. And I think that's a big difference in, in mindset a bit that we use in a way the scientist, but once the project are presented, it's up to the filmmaker. It's an auto-driven documentary. The boss here is without any doubt the director, not the scientist. Okay. Thank you. Um, there's another question for Tom in the Q and A. Um, what were the main reasons why anti-mining organizations didn't want to participate in the documentary? What do you think? Well, you know, if you want my honest opinion, I think they're cowards. Yes, that's uh, very clear, hard words. Um, yeah, I guess they will say that uh, they didn't want to participate in a film that uh, had a storyline which um, led to the conclusion that we will need to responsibly mine energy transition metals in Europe. And yes, some of these uh, activist organizations are then just uh, anti and that's typical typical for, for Europe, by the way. It's what I call the banana syndrome. It uh, builds absolutely nothing anywhere near anything or anyone. So basically, we block everything that happens here from an industrial point of view. And we allow it to happen somewhere else in the world at conditions which are much worse than the ESG criteria that we can uphold here in, in the north of Europe in particular. As I show in a documentary, Finland and Sweden, they're the top two countries in the world in terms of environment, social and governance criteria in their activities. So they are the benchmark in the world. They are the example to show how it can be done in a proper way. And if we don't do it there, then basically we want it to be done elsewhere. And then we export our moral responsibility rather than doing it here. Bimbi, better in my backyard. Uh, which is the the only moral uh, position to to have, and and I think that's a big difference with our present documentary where we have um, Stefan Mikaelson, the leader of the Sami Parliament, who is heavily opposed to mining in the north of Sweden uh, because it affects the traditional reindeer husbandry culture of the Sami population. Uh, so we have that perspective uh, in the documentary. It's uh, presented in a very respectful way. Uh, we show it's a very authentic, authentic uh, view on, on the matter. And these people, they're also, let's say, they um, they walk the talk because the way they live is completely different from the way that we live in the rest of Europe. So these people, they live in harmony with nature. They are not consumerists, uh, they don't have a consumerist lifestyle like we do here in Europe. They don't go on city trips to Barcelona, they don't have 10 smartphones and laptops, uh, they don't uh, do any of those things that we all find normal in the rest of Europe, for which we actually need metals. Uh, so, so they walk the talk, they're, they're, they're honest, so to speak. So I, I have respect for their anti-mining opposition. I don't have respect for anti-mining opposition when it's coming from people who are writing all of this on their smartphones, laptops, who fly around all over the world, who need an enormous amount of metals to do those kind of activities. That's purely hypocritical, in my view. Okay, thank that you. That was an answer to your question. Yeah, it's uh, it's coming from the chat. So um, yeah. another one um, that's coming in. So you, you talked about the impact that the first documentary generated. Was it something you anticipated or did you expect it or hoped for? And maybe then something that you now aim for in your following documentaries because it's, yeah, it came from the first one or how do you see this? Well, as I said in the beginning, uh, I think a, a good documentary needs to be controversial. If everything is like 
100% uh, nuanced and you have all the ifs and buts in there, then it becomes like a scientific paper. Uh, and that's good for a scientific paper, obviously. But for a documentary, that doesn't work. So you need to have some strong opinions. You need to have some strong statements, which, of course, are simplistic. When I say that Europeans want Teslas, we don't want the mines in their backyard, and that's hypocritical. Of course, it's a simplistic statement. You can't generalize. Scientifically, it doesn't make any sense to do that. So you would never write that in a scientific paper. But you get the metaphor that a lot of people in Europe, they want the smartphones, they want the tablets, they want the, the trips to Barcelona, they want all the, the common luxury. And now more and more, they also want to have electric vehicles, and then in particular Tesla, because that was then the the um, the metaphor for the, the, the flashy electric vehicle, basically. Uh, that has changed already a bit now over the last years. But at, at those times, it was really the flashy vehicle that everybody wants. So when we say Europeans want Tesla, but they don't want the mind, I don't, I don't mean to say that every single European person wants a Tesla. Obviously not. That it goes without saying. But it just shows you the, the metaphor for what is happening, that we Europeans, we import raw materials, we import the final clean tech products or the, the, or the smartphones or the laptops, we all find that pretty normal, but we don't want the environmental or social repercussions of the mining that is needed to produce those products. And that is extremely hypocritical. And that's a general statement I dare to, to make. So in a way, I have to thank the anti-mining lobby that they uh, made such a fuss because they, they tried to stop the publication of a documentary. They tried to block it during the last days, and they almost started a legal case against us. So probably because of that controversy, the attention for the documentary was boosted. So in mm -hmm. a way, I need to thank them for being so, so negative and so aggressive towards me. So because as a result, we, we got all the attention, which obviously we, we created the debate. And now the result of that is the European Critical Raw Materials Act has four benchmark numbers officially in the document. It's 10% domestic mining, 40% domestic refining, 25% recycling, and not being dependent on other countries for more than 65% on one particular country. So the 10% domestic extraction is a new thing. It was not accepted even within the European Commission five years ago. Because then we still had this idea that we live in a globalized world, we can just import the raw materials from somewhere else. Why would we why would we open mines here in Europe and go through all this difficult procedure with local inhabitants that would be against these mines? And why would we do that if we can just have that done in Indonesia or China or Africa? So that's the hypocrisy I'm talking about. And and the European Commission has seen that now and the COVID crisis and the, the war in Ukraine has made that very clear that we can't be dependent on those countries any longer because it makes us really vulnerable in Europe. Thank you. Maybe in the last two minutes, I uh, I ask a question to, to Frank still that's coming up in the Q&A. So I, I will combine two questions. So someone is asking, uh, would you rather encourage like young researchers or more experienced postdocs, for example, to participate? And then following on that question, how many candidates are there on average? Or maybe just in the last one, because yeah, the average is just one for now. And what do you think are the odds of passing the first election rounds? Well, um, so I would say the most important thing is that you have an interesting research subject and are willing and are prepared and have time to you know to the pitch but also to have you know take some time in the months following dogville to participate in a documentary i'm sure that uh, peter can attest to that you have to you know you have to take some time to actually do a documentary it's not not something you you just do a few hours and then you're over and over and done with uh in regards to you know what the chances are like you said it's it's i only done one edition with one university and if i uh, if I recall correctly, I think we had about 20 submissions for eventually 10 uh, projects being selected. However, now it will be more strict as we have three universities and only three 
a project per university is going to be selected. But I'm, I don't think we'll get 20 submissions per year. To be honest, I don't know yet. Uh, and, may I ask a question? Is there a reason why Kyle Leuven is not involved? That you have to ask uh, Kyle Leuven. No budget. No budget. No budget. No budget. Yeah, we're a very poor university. Yeah, you see. <laughs> it's it's really, it's really, uh, it, that's another discussion. It's really, really too bad because they do support the festival in general, but not this uh, specific, specific competition. And it's really, the money doesn't go to the festival, it goes to the creation of the, of the, of the film. So if you have any connection with Carol Leuven, do encourage them to participate. We didn't, we didn't speak to. <laughs> and young and young or not well again so it doesn't really matter i would say if you have a great subject just participate and uh, i'm sure you will be um, at least in the first selection okay i think with that we will have to conclude this discussion sadly uh but i want to thank you once more frank and tom for being here for answering the questions for giving these very nice insights um and i hope to see more of you uh, in the future, for sure, with the documentaries and with the science field program. Yeah. All right. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Uh, cheers.